Hey folks, we're back in uh, the Elmhurst trauma room. We're going to do uh, the second instructional video by James Nishi and myself. Um, today what we're going to talk about is the skills of laryngoscopy. So we're not going to talk about airway management in terms of drugs or in terms of sequencing. We're just going to talk about laryngoscopy itself. And we got one helper here. Um, and so let's get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about is positioning the patient. Now, there's been a lot of confusion perpetrated throughout the uh, years, and I don't know where it first started on, in terms of how to position a patient. And most of the, uh, the confusion comes from what is sniffing position. So, uh, hopefully we'll get a volunteer in here and we'll show you what sniffing So we have Ms. Clark, uh, one of our uh, excellent administrators here at Elmhurst, and she's going to help us out here. So, Paul, we're talking about good and bad sniffing position. So what I need you to do first is help me demonstrate bad sniffing position. So grab this bouquet of flowers, a lovely bouquet. I think they're roses, I'm not sure. And you're just going to shove that in my face. All right? Step all the way up. And, and say, you two-timing bastard, or something along those lines. There we go. Now, so I'm, I'm getting stuffed in my face, and I'm sniffing them. But look at my neck here. I'm sniffing with my head all the way back. And you can see, it, it is a sniffing position. I'm able to sniff the roses, but that is an example of bad sniffing position. That will be a sniffing position that will not allow you to intubate the patient. Now we'll demonstrate good sniffing position. So Paula, say, I bought you these flowers. I bought you these flowers. Do you like them? Oh, they're lovely. Oh, okay. So here is an example of good sniffing position. I'm still sniffing, but now you can see my head is back and my neck is flexed forward. And that's good sniffing position. Thank you so much. And then how do we know on a mannequin or on a patient what good and bad sniffing position is. Well, we could kind of get the idea that this is bad sniffing position, and good sniffing position would be something like this. But is there an objective way? Well, there is. And if you look at your external auditory meatus, it needs to be on the same horizontal plane as your sternal notch. So the ear hole is at the same plane as the neck hole. And that's the key. So instead of doing something like this, where my ear hole's all the way back here, and my neck hole is up front over here, we want something like this. Ear hole, neck hole, same plane. We demonstrate on our mannequin friend right here. Here's his ear hole, and here's his sternal notch. What we need to do is get them at the same level, which on him looks something very much like this. And this is ideal sniffing position. You can see we have about five inches of space underneath his head. Now you could get a partner to hold up the patient for you, but a better way to go is grab some sheets. Stack those underneath the patient's head until you start getting him into the sniffing vision. Now you might need to put a few under the shoulder as well, but the key is that you're not patting the shoulder to put the head back. You're patting the shoulder just to eliminate any dead space. And now you can see external auditory meatus at the same level as the sternal notch. This is ideal positioning. For every patient, you should be able to draw a straight line from here to here. And if you could do that, then the patient's adequately positioned. And at that point, you'll tilt the head back as far as you can, and that is true sniffing position. And that will optimize your intubation. What you'll find is sometimes you'll have such a difficult airway, you'll have to call anesthesia, and they'll come down and properly position your patient and get it on their first try. And that just makes us feel foolish. So, before any intubation, crash or not, ideal positioning will optimize your first pass success rate. And that's incredibly important because every pass you make leads to the more potential for the patient to vomit for airway swelling. So optimal positioning before the intubation attempt. Right. Now you're actually ready to try laryngoscopy. And the way we talk about laryngoscopy, um, and of course if you know me, I'm always going to talk about everything from the cognitive perspective. And when you're in the midst of a difficult procedure, it's, it's easy to lose sight of the individual steps. So what I like to talk about is to have a goal for each step of laryngoscopy. And if you've accomplished the goal, only then do you move on to the next step. So the first step, proper positioning. And our goal is to have this hole on the same line as this hole. We've accomplished that. We can now move on to the next step. And the next step of laryngoscopy is to open the mouth. And if you don't open the mouth wide enough to translate your mandibular processes, you can't dislocate the jaw when you try to intubate the patient. 
On yourself, what you do is push your fingers one centimeter forward and one centimeter down from your auditory meatus, and then slowly open your mouth. And what you'll feel is your actual mandible pop out against your fingers. Until that point, you cannot intubate this patient very easily. So, what you want to do is on your patient, open the mouth wide enough for that to happen. And you don't actually have to feel. You just open the mouth as wide as possible, and you'll be able to dislocate that jaw when the time comes. If you don't open the mouth very much, if you just put your blade in like this, there's a good chance you'll not be able to successfully intubate the patient. Especially for trauma patients where their head's not tilted back, and therefore the jaw's not opening automatically. For those folks, very difficult to intubate unless you get a nice big mouth opening with scissor technique. So that's your first cognitive step, and you know you've accomplished it when the mouth is open. All right, your next cognitive step is you grab your laryngoscope, and you just put it in the mouth. Now on this guy, it's easy for me to put an inch of the blade in the mouth. And that, if you've done that, you've accomplished the next step. But some folks, because they'll have a big chest or they're pregnant, you won't be able to get this blade in the mouth. You'll try to get it in, and it's not going to work. What you'll do in that case is just drop it in one inch horizontally and then turn. And now you accomplish the next step of laryngoscopy, which is to have one inch of blade in the mouth. If we've accomplished that, we can move on. Next step is to hold your laryngoscope blade very lightly, and you go dead center down the tongue. And you're just going to inch down the tongue ever so slowly until you see a sliver of epiglottis. And we'll show you a screenshot of that, what that looks like. But right now I'm looking at a sliver of epiglottis at the base of this tongue. See a sliver of epiglottis. I'm not lifting at all. You can see I'm putting no pressure really on this blade whatsoever. I've just inched my way down the tongue and until I saw a sliver of epiglottis. And now I stop because I've completed a cognitive step. I'm ready to move on. At this point, this hand goes to the thyroid cartilage. And what you're seeking to do now is take the potential space of the molecular, which I see right now, and turn it into an actual space. And the way that happens is by pushing down on your thyroid cartilage. And so you take this potential space and you make it a big actual space. Now I have a huge molecula. So the next step is to make the molecule an actual space and slide your blade into it. All right, my blade is now lodged in the molecule. This is the first time I'm actually going to be applying much pressure at all to the laryngoscope blade. And what I'll do now is at the same time I'm lifting up with the blade, I'm pushing down with my fingers on the thyroid part. So I'm doing bimanual laryngoscopy. And what I'm looking for is the posterior notch. That's my next landmark. When I see the posterior notch, I know I've identified the cords. And now I'll stop, and in my mind I'll say, I've now identified the posterior notch. If you're not finding it, don't go on, because that's how you wind up in the esophagus. So you're going to keep lifting until you see the posterior notch, which is the most posterior structure of the airway. Once you see the notch, now you're going to optimize your view. And that just means more burp, more external laryngeal manipulation, maybe a little more lifting, until you have a great view of the cords. That's your next step. Have enough view of the cords so you can pass it to. If you only still have that posterior notch, grab a bougie. If you see the posterior notch, you'll be able to pass the bougie. And the last step of this is now going to be to pass the tube. So now we're ready to actually pass our tube. And we have our tube set up what we call straight to cuff, which means it's totally straight until the cuff, and then we put a 35 degree bend on. Now, on a real patient, it should be at least an 8O tube, unless there's some compelling reason not to use an 8O. It makes pulmonary toilet a lot easier. Now, here's the mistake people make. They see their cords, they're all excited, and they get in there, and they're ready to pass the tube like this. That will cut your view entirely of the laryngeal orifice. What you want to do instead is you turn it horizontally like this. And you come, your eyes are totally on the cords, and you're coming in from the side horizontally. You're not going to see anything to obstruct your view until the tube is directly in front of the cords. And then you can actually see the tube pass through. So again, the motion is horizontal, 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 horizontal. And only at the last second do I tilt it in and turn. What this allows you to do is since you're coming in horizontally, look at this. I can go up, 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 up for an anterior larynx. Oh, I can go down, down, down for a posterior. I have full control with just the tiniest movement of my fingers. I don't have to do any great big motions like this, uh, you know, pushing up against the back of the patient's throat to try to move it in. So you come in horizontally, and only at the last second do you tilt the tube in. 
Same thing with the bougie, that's the motion. Horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. Tilt until you're just in front of the cords. You see the tip at the cords, and then only at the last second, you go forward. Now sometimes, you'll get to that very last bit, and you'll have the tip of the tube through the cords, and you can't advance. Just have your friend pop the stylet out about a centimeter, and then you'll be able to advance all the way in. All right, then obviously tube confirmation, all that stuff comes next. But what we're talking about is the skills of laryngoscopy. So we'll review those and we'll show you the pictures on screen now of everything we've done. All right, folks, what we're going to do now is show you what things look like from the view of the laryngoscope. Because we've already seen what it looks like on the camera. So we're just going to go step by step just like before. So step one is to position the patient. And you can see here I got a textbook under the patient and their external auditory notch is at the same level as their sternal notch. So the whole same level as the notch. All right. Our next goal is to open the mouth. And we're going to do that with a cross finger technique. So we know we've done it when we've opened the mouth enough that the mandibles have translated. Our next goal is blade insertion. So we're going to insert the blade one inch into the mouth. Just like that. So only one inch of the laryngoscope is in the mouth right now. I'll show you that again. I'm just going in one inch and I'm stopping because we've accomplished the goal. If you can't get it in because the patient's chest wall is just blocking you, then go in horizontally one inch and turn. But now you've accomplished the goal when one inch is in the mouth. Your next goal is to find the epiglottis. No force whatsoever being applied to the blade. You're just sliding it up and down the tongue. And if we slide down the tongue, slide, oh, I found epiglottis. There it is right there. You see that sliver of epiglottis at the bottom of the shot? I'm not going near it. I'm not putting any force on the tongue. I'm just finding the epiglottis. I see a sliver. I've accomplished the goal. The next step is to convert the potential space of the molecule into an actual space. And that's using external laryngeal manipulation. And when you push down on the thyroid cartilage, you can see the molecular is now really big. Let's look at that again. So I see a sliver of epiglottis, push down on the thyroid, and now I have a real molecula. So next step is to seat the blade into the molecula. And you'll know because the epiglottis will pop up. I'm now in the molecula. I haven't exerted any force on my laryngoscope as of yet. All right, the next step is to find the posterior notch. And already, we've seated in the molecule without any force, and I see my posterior notch. Look, there it's gone. Posterior notch, interretinoid notch, and the posterior cartilages are in sight. That's my landmark. Until I find that, I don't know where the cords are. Once I do, I am happy. I know I can intubate this patient. So first you find the epiglottis, and then you find the notch. Now, once you've found the notch, you're not going to optimize your view. And this is the first time you lift the laryngoscope, and you do some more external laryngeal manipulation, and now I have a great view of the cords. Now, if I didn't, I would keep lifting until the patient's head actually left the bed. That's how I know I've lifted enough. In this case, I already have a great view. I can see my notch, I can see my cartilage, and I can see my cords. Last step is to pass the tube. Now, again, we're going to enter horizontally, and I'm entering right now, but yet you don't see my bougie because I'm not going to see it until the very last second. So now, I actually, for the first time, see my tip. But since I'm entering horizontally, my field of vision is not blocked at all. Now, I look for the notch, which is right there, and I know, even though I'm not seeing cords right now because I'm not lifting, as long as it goes anterior to that notch, which I could see very well on this shot, it is in the cords. If it goes posterior to the notch, I know I'm not. I know I'm in the esophagus. So you enter horizontally, the tip will only come into view at the last second, and then you, by manipulating just with tiny little finger movements, I could put it behind the notch, or as I want it to be, in front of the notch. And even as it passes, I could still visualize my notch, and I know I'm now in the cords.